give us a talk on does your brain have gender? Um, Melissa is one of the advanced students tutors. I am. Yes. Among other things. Some of my two teens are here. <laughs> yeah, so without further ado, um, these talks, as always, are informal, so feel free to ask questions throughout the talk. And there are yummy snacks and wine to follow afterwards if you continue chatting about the topic. Okay, oh, thank thank you. you. Okay, does your brain have a gender? So um, I'm well placed to address this question because I wrote a book published in 2004 called Brain Gender. And the title at the time struck people as unusual because people think of the brain as a biological thing and gender as a socially constructed thing. And the point I was trying to make is that that's not correct for either. The brain is influenced by the environment, and everything we do and everything we think has a biological basis. So that's the point of the title. That's a good question. Sure. Are we differentiating gender and sex with sex being? Like we can do that. Yes. Yeah. So historically, sex and gender have been differentiated, with sex referring to say chromosomes, you're identified as male or female based on your chromosomes, or maybe on your gonads, testes for males, ovaries for female. And then other things like behaviors and psychological characteristics are referred to as gender. Um, for a while, many people were avoiding that distinction because the people who were saying, let's call these things gender, were saying that gender was all socially constructed. So people who thought that that wasn't the whole story were reluctant to use that term because it carried that causal kind of information. But now we've moved on from that, and people understand that gender also has, is a combination, develops under the influence of a combination of factors, including some that are more biological. If you were to go online and look for a book to tell you about gender and the brain, or gender and behavior, you get two very different points of view. One is exemplified here by a book called The Female Brain by Luann Brizendine. And she's got a brain there made out of computer wire. And her point is that males and females are hardwired from the very beginning to be very different. There's a female brain and a male brain. In contrast, um, Cornelia Fine wrote a book at about the same time called Delusions of Gender. And she describes a lot of social influences on gender development, which are correct. But she also argues that all of the information that suggests that there are some inborn contributions is wrong and delusional. So two very different points of view. And I hope I will persuade you that both points of view have an element of truth, but both are incomplete. So this is an overview of what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk a lot about the influences of testosterone on brain development and behavioral and psychological outcomes. And we're going to talk about animal models where people have manipulated testosterone and seen effects. And then we're going to talk about human research, which obviously can't do those powerful kinds of manipulations. But it's based on the information from animals. And then we're going to talk about um, other types of influences on gender development, influences of the social environment, for instance. And I want to give you the idea of nature and nurture working together rather than a nature or nurture perspective. And I also will talk about different kinds of gendered outcomes. So one of the points I'll make is that your brain doesn't have a gender because you are a complicated mixture of gendered elements. And these, this body of research is relevant not just to understanding why men and women on the average are different, but it's also about understanding why individuals within each gender or sex differ from one another. These are the factors that are known to influence human gender development beginning with the sex chromosomes, genetic factors, and then gonadal steroids, particularly testosterone, during early development. I'm going to talk a lot about that because I've spent a lot of my <coughs> career studying those kinds of influences. 
but also social reinforcement for parents, peers, teachers, everybody basically, and self-socialization. Children in particular self-socialize their gender's behavior. So here is the X and the Y chromosome. Um, the X chromosome has a lot more genetic information than the Y chromosome does. This is a trick photography. The X chromosome actually is a lot bigger than the Y chromosome. But the Y chromosome has some really important information that causes the gonads, which are identical to begin with in both males and females, to become testes. And this happens at about week seven of gestation. And in the fetus, the testes are active. We know that in children, the testes aren't active until puberty. But in the fetus, the testes are active. And this has dramatic consequences. So thousands of studies of non-human animals show that testosterone and hormones produced from it, prenatally and just after birth, influence brain development and behavior. And these effects have been called organizational effects. And that's because the hormone seems to influence the fundamental organization of the brain. And as a consequence, even though the hormone's only there for a short period, its effects persist across the lifespan. And we're more familiar with activational kind of influences of hormones. These are transient, they occur in adulthood, and as hormones rise and fall, behavior might change. So a good example um, is in rats, for instance, at some times when estrogen and progesterone are high, they are show sexual interest, female rats, but then they don't when those hormones go away. Um, in contrast, these organizational effects persist. Here's, yeah. <laughs> Testosterone purely comes from the fetus, so is it purely a male issue? So, in, during gestation, um, males have higher levels of testosterone than females. And a woman carrying a male fetus won't have a different testosterone from a woman carrying a female fetus. So, and we think that the fetus is protected from hormones coming in from the external world. So it's mainly a difference between having testes or not having testes. But the adrenal gland also produces some testosterone. And we'll talk about people who have too many adrenal androgens in a few minutes. Um, and we're not that, people are studying whether the environmental um, pesticides and other kinds of chemicals might be getting into the fetus and causing endocrine disruption, as it's been called. But um, it's generally thought that that's unusual. So one of the behaviors, obviously the most obvious behavior that's been studied in a lot of species is sexual behavior. But other behaviors are influenced by the early hormone environment too. And one of them is rough and tumble play. This is a kind of playful aggression that is engaged in by most mammals and more so by males than by females. So here are two rats, young juvenile rats engaging in rough and tumble play. And um, in this study that I did a long time ago, uh, when I was a postdoc at UCLA, we gave the developing rats testosterone injections, and then we looked at the females' play behavior in that situation, and the females who were treated with androgens, testosterone is a type of androgen, this is testosterone propionate, um, showed higher levels, more male typical behavior in this respect. And this um, has also been seen in rhesus macaques, so these are two young rhesus macaques engaging in a bout of rough and tumble play. And people have injected pregnant uh, rhesus macaques with testosterone for several weeks during gestation, and then looked at the behavior of their offspring several years later, and found the same result, that the ones who had been exposed to testosterone during development showed more of this male typical behavior. And people have done the opposite, too. They've removed hormones from males, either by taking their testes out or by treating them with anti-androgens. And then the males show more female behavior and less male behavior. And these are not um, isolated findings. It's been seeing similar findings, especially for sexual behavior, in a lot of different rodents and in ferrets and in sheep and hyenas and bees <coughs> and, as I mentioned, rhesus and there are literally thousands of studies showing these effects in non-human mammals. And uh, they reveal some 
general principles that we can use to guide research on whether this might be occurring in people as well. So there are sensitive periods, as I mentioned, and these correspond to times when testosterone is elevated in developing males compared to developing females. And testosterone at these times influences physical development. That's why males are born looking different to females. It's because testosterone is interacted with receptors on their external genitalia and made them into a male pattern. And without that testosterone, the female pattern develops. But there are receptors for the hormones in the brain as well. And so testosterone and hormones produced from it also seem to act on the brain. And testosterone and hormones produced from it have been found to influence cell survival in rodents. And um, so you can go in and look. There are cells in the hypothalamus, which is a, a primitive part of the brain that's involved in sexual behavior. And you can see cells dying during early development. And in one particular nucleus, cells die more in females than in males. And in another nucleus, they die less in females than in males. And if you treat them with testosterone, it changes the pattern of cell death. So in one part of the brain, testosterone is rescuing cells from cell death. In another part of the brain, it's causing them to die. So it's a very complicated system. Doesn't affect every part of the brain, but areas where there are receptors for these hormones are candidates for um, the effects. And the behaviors in brain regions that, that show sex differences are the ones that are affected by these gonadal steroids. The effects are linear and graded, so if you give more, you get a bigger effect. But there are species differences. So all the species that have been studied show some of these effects. Some behaviors are affected, but that can differ from species to species which behavior is affected. So you have to look at humans if you want to know if, if, whether this applies at all to us. So there are two periods during early development when testosterone is higher in developing males than fetuses than females. One is during fetal development from about week 8 to 24 of gestation. And then um, again during the early postnatal period from about the first to the fourth month of postnatal life there's a surge in, in testosterone. How can we study um, whether testosterone influences human development? We can't inject pregnant women with hormones. We can't remove testes from developing males. That wouldn't be ethical. Um, but there are some disorders that cause hormone abnormalities. Uh, these are called intersex conditions because usually the babies are born with ambiguous external genitalia because testosterone is involved in development of the external genitalia. Uh, more recently, they've been called disorders of sex development. And the one that's been studied the most is something called congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And I'll be talking about that tonight. There are also our offspring of women who were treated with hormones during pregnancy for medical conditions. And people have studied those offspring. And most recently, people have been trying to relate normal variability in early hormone levels to later behavior. And I've italicized the first and the third because we'll talk a little bit about those two approaches. So what is congenital adrenal hyperplasia? It's an autosomal recessive disorder. It occurs in about 1 in 10 to 15,000 births in North America and Western Europe. It's caused by an enzymatic deficiency, typically in 21 hydroxylase, and this causes the adrenal glands to be unable to produce cortisol. And as a consequence, the hormones that would be used to produce cortisol get shunted into a pathway that causes androgen production. And affected girls are born with virilized external genitalia. So it's quite variable how virilized the genitalia are. Sometimes they're assigned and reared as boys initially because they look just like boys. Other times it's more subtle. Um, most often it's in between. So the, when the parents want to know if they've had a girl or a boy, the answer isn't clear, but this is usually diagnosed very rapidly within about a week, and then the girls are treated with um, corticosteroids postnatally to normalize their hormone levels. So from birth on, things are more normal, but during prenatal development, they've been exposed to more testosterone than would usually be the case. And what behaviors would we look at? Well. Um, behaviors that show sex differences. And there's a large body of research on this topic, too. 
the most obvious one is gender identity. So uh, most people who look like me think of themselves as females. Uh, most people who have a Y chromosome and look like men think of themselves as men and don't think of themselves as females. So us thinking of ourselves as females versus boys and men thinking of themselves as not females is a big, big difference. Uh, sexual orientation, also most people who have a Y chromosome and look like men are attracted sexually to women more so than to men. And for women, that's not the case. So that's another big sex difference. And there are smaller sex differences in a lot of other behaviors, including childhood toy and activity preferences, including rough and tumble play, just like the rats and monkeys, some personality characteristics, and some specific cognitive abilities. How big are these differences? So I've expressed these differences using um, standard deviation units here. So the sex difference in gender identity is enormous. I put height here because that's a sex difference we're all familiar with, that um, men are taller than women on the average, but some women are taller than some men, and that is about two standard deviations in size. Children's play and interest in different kinds of toys are about the same size as the sex difference in height. And all these other things that we sometimes read a lot about in the newspapers, that women are more empathic and men are better at mental rotation abilities, show such smaller sex differences, about the half the size of the sex difference in height at the base. So, and in addition, there are lots of behaviors not on this slide because they don't show appreciable sex differences. What were examples of boys' toys versus Cars, trucks, guns are boys' toys, girls' toys are dolls, tea sets. And is the difference between the two significant or the standard? No, no, it's about the same. It depends on what toys you choose. So you can make the differences bigger or smaller by choosing your toys. And I've studied toys a lot. Now why would I study toys? I was giving a lecture similar to this one to the first year students in psychology. And some computer scientists take psychology and one of them raised his hand and he said, why don't you study something important like computers? <laughs> And I have reasons for studying this. One is it shows a large sex difference, so you have something needy to work with. It's very easy to assess it reliably to just watch children playing. Um, it predicts some adult behaviors like sexual orientation, not perfectly, of course, but it, on a group level. And this is a period when the gonads aren't producing hormones, so you don't have to worry about activational effects that might be interfering with your results. So, sorry, what is your what like age do you assess kids? Um, we assess children as young as three to five months of age. And, um, but in the studies <coughs> I'm going to show you, this study, three to eight year old children. Okay. So this it's one look at toy preferences. Three to eight is a really good age range. In terms of predicting the sexual orientation, um, how, how long are they? What's the longitudinal range, if you may? If I were being looking at sexual orientation, how long would you be? I would be looking at adults then. But would you be assessing their their behavior as a child and then just following how they? Behave? Oh, how do people know that childhood behavior is is related to later sexual orientation? Yes, they've studied people longitudinally. Yeah. How have the differences in the toys they play changed over time? The years, not very much. Yes, we've just done a big meta-analysis and it hasn't changed very much with time. The toys change somewhat because your manufacturers change the toys, but the things like the vehicles and the dolls haven't changed very much over time. What about more neutral toys like Lincoln Logs, things that Yeah, so I so like for example, the neutral toys. Uh, Lincoln logs are pretty neutral. So, it, and our meta-analysis showed us that what we thought were neutral toys actually were kind of female preferred, but really to a very small extent. What people have labeled neutral toys. So the one way we do the research is to bring children into a playroom and see what they play with. And this study I'm gonna tell you about was um, girls with CAH, as well as boys with CAH and their unaffected relatives who served as controls. Um, 
and that's important because it controls to a great extent for family factors and for to some extent for genetic background other than having CAA. Can I just really quickly, so you mentioned the effects, the sort of obvious effects of CAA on girls, so what effect does it have on boys as well? So yeah. Increased testosterone. Well, what happens in boys is their testosterone, their adrenals produce a lot of androgens, and then their testes compensate by reducing their production. So boys have essentially normal, boys with CAH have essentially normal androgen levels prenatally. Because there are feedback mechanisms in the brain. The brain knows how much androgen you've got, and so it shuts off some of its testicular production. So, so how is it then diagnosed if it's not? In boys, boys? Well, now there's universal screening, oh. but it used to be that um, you'd have to wait till they had a medical problem to know that they had this, and that they would have premature puberty if they weren't treated. That would be the last point of which you find them. This would be kind of a premature question, but do you see any differences when, like, like male children have like older like female sisters or like sisters or something? Like, Small differences. Like, change point yes, yes. So we have done a study with the Avon Longitudinal Study of Pregnancy and Childhood, where we had um, about eleven thousand children that we studied, and if you had an older brother, you were a little more masculine. And older sister, you were a little more feminine, but really small. We saw these effects because we had a huge sample. You wouldn't see them if you went and got 40 girls and 40 boys. Okay, so in this study, um, people in the 1960s had reported that girls with CAH were what they called tomboys. And they said, they say they like to play with boys' toys, they like to play with boys. But this was quite controversial, and people said, well, maybe that's just because they were born looking more masculine, <coughs> maybe they think of themselves as more masculine, and most of the data actually came from interviewing the mothers. And people said, well, maybe the mothers just see them as more masculine because they were born looking like boys. So um, we thought we should bring them into the playroom and see what they chose to play with. And so we did that. So we had, this was one of the playrooms we used. We change our toys over the years because the manufacturers change what's available to us. But the important things are the cars, fire truck, gun, various dolls. Um, these are kind of hair um, and makeup kind of toys, key sets. And the neutral toys are things like picture books or puzzles or drawing supplies. So our prediction is that the girls with CIH are going to spend more time than their unaffected sisters with the boys' toys, and less time than their unaffected sisters with the girls' toys, and they're not going to differ for the neutral toys. So the first question is, um, do children differ by sex in their interaction with these toys? So these are the unaffected children. And yes, on the average, so each dot here is a child. And you can see that although there are average differences, the boys who are the blue bars spend more time than the girls who are the red bar with the boys' toys. And the girls who are the red bar spend more time than the boys with the girls' toys. And there's no difference in the neutral toys. But some boys aren't spending much time at all with the boys' toys. And some girls are spending quite a bit of time. But these are average differences. So you can't say that every girl's going to play this way or every boy, but if you test a group of them, you'll see these differences. I just have a question. I guess I'm still confused about how you define girls' and boys' toys. Like, for instance, if you had, like, a Barbie doll convertible that was pink. Like, well, we is wouldn't it the fact use that, that it's because weird, it's like, too confusing. Yeah. So we define it empirically. Right? This is how we define it. We used other studies to say, okay, when other people use dolls, girls spend more time with them. When other people use trucks, boys spend more time with them. So we're going to use those. Okay. So it's, so it's, it's all just empirical. like a social construct. Of, Sorry? So it's like a social construct of what is the. No, it's empirically it's based. Okay. So what people have found girls spend more, more time with than boys okay. do is a girl's toy. Okay. And what people have found boys spend more time with than mm -hmm. girls do mm -hmm. is a boy's toy. Um, was there a way of like controlling for? Like how much they play with those kind of toys outside of the playroom. For example, if you're eight years old, you probably are used to playing with a certain set of toys because they've been available or given to you for years. Is there some way of taking that into account? Um, it's hard. 
because you could go to their homes and make lists of the toys, but that's just a snapshot at one time. You could ask their parents. Um, so one thing about this kind of research is you assume that to some extent things are randomly changing in in the person's environment, and that's true for all the <coughs> groups of children. It may be a wrong assumption, but it, it contributes to the error in your study. Is there a control for culture? Or? For culture. No, all of these particular children were American children. And some of them were from Los Angeles, and some of them were from Chicago. But um, were the differences between the LA and the Chicago? No. Was that what the study was carried off? Yes, in LA and Chicago. Okay. So what did we find for the girls with CAH? So we found they're the yellow bar here. We found that they spent more time with the boys' toys than their unaffected sisters did. And the boys with and without CAH, so a small difference, but it's not a significant difference. And the girls with CAH spent less time with the girls' toys than their unaffected sisters did. And again, the boys with and without CAH don't differ. And none of the groups differed from one another in time with the neutral toys. So that suggested that there was some difference in their behavior. Now, we aren't the only people who have done this type of study. Some people use questionnaires. Sometimes we use questionnaires. Um, two other research teams, separate independent research teams, have used toy setups similar to ours and found the same results. And these little flags show um, where people are located who have done these kinds of studies and found similar results. So it's a robust, replicated finding. So several groups in North America, one in Canada, others in the US, um, two groups here in, in England, Netherlands, Germany, Sweden, and even Japan. So that's as, as cross-cultural as it's gotten so far. <coughs> now, CAH is not a proper <coughs> experiment. People aren't being randomly assigned to get testosterone or not. Um, people with CAH, girls are born with masculine appearing um, physical characteristics, and maybe they're treated differently or have different self-concepts. So in this kind of research area, you look around for other types of evidence that might reinforce the conclusion that androgen is the responsible agent or perhaps refute that idea. So there are other disorders. One is XY women with something called complete androgen insensitivity syndrome. So these are individuals who have Y chromosome. They have testes, but their cells lack functioning androgen receptors. So it's as if the androgen isn't there. They're born looking female because androgen is needed to make the external genitalia appear male. Um, usually they, they go through childhood and um, then just never go through puberty. They have breast development because the androgen gets converted to estrogen and that causes breast development, but they never menstruate. And so they're taken to their GP, and eventually it's discovered that they have this disorder called complete androgen insensitivity syndrome. Sometimes they're diagnosed earlier um, because it seems they have hernias, and then they discover they have undescended testes. So, sorry. Um, so anyway, they show more female typical boy interests and play interests than men or boys do. Have been independently replicated. So these 
other things are not as well established. So those should come with a kind of warning flag that we don't really know this yet because until you see something independently replicated, um, you shouldn't take it too seriously. Although it's fun to see it and think about it. Okay, so I've been talking about genetic factors and testosterone during early development. There's also a huge body of research on how the social environment influences gendered behavior. So parents, for instance, treat girls and boys very differently. They buy them different toys. They reinforce them for playing with gender type toys. So do peers, especially in the age range about four to six. They're very strict about enforcing gender related behavior. Teachers do this, strangers do this. We facilitate strangers doing this by dressing our babies as girls and boys, and even if they're bald, because they're still little babies who put bows on their heads and things to make, make it clear that they are girls or boys. Um, so in this study, we looked at three to 10 year old children with CAH and unaffected relatives in the playroom once again, and toy choices were assessed once again. But this time we also wanted to look at positive and negative parental reactions when the children were choosing various toys, or even the parents introducing various toys to the children. So are these parents treating the girls with CAH differently is the question. Sorry, yes. did, did it, occur, it occurred to me to ask seeing the slide of whether the children were tested alone in the playroom. I mean, I assume they were completely unattended, but uh, were, were there just one child at a time? In one child at a time. Yes, and um, sometimes there was a camera in the corner. And when we were doing that study, it was a long time ago, so cameras were kind of big things. <laughs> and you'd have it on a tripod in the corner. Other times, we'd have a um, one-way mirror, so we'd be in the next room. We could see them, but they couldn't see us. So they're, they're, they were effectively alone in the playroom? Yes, yes, yes. And in this case, they're going to be effectively alone in the playroom, and then they're going to be with their mother in the playroom, or their father in the playroom, and then they're going to be with the other parent in the playroom. Okay, so, and that's randomly ordered so that there are no order effects. And here we are, there's the toys again, same idea. And so we come to the positive and negative parental behavior. So positive things were like play initiation, like let's play with this, and bringing the truck or the doll in. Um, praise, affection, helpful inquiry. Negative reactions were criticism or ridicule. You look silly playing with that, for instance. Refusal to play, ignoring the play, or suggesting something else to play with. Um, and I just want to show you that the children behave pretty much the same as in the prior study. This is a new group of children, but the girls with CIH are playing more with the boys' toys than the unaffected girls. There's a question. Oh yeah, I just had a question about, do you think the parents their actions could be affected by the fact that they know they're being watched. Oh yeah, oh yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I mean, that's always the dilemma, is you bring people into the lab and what impact does that have on their behavior? But we still do it. <laughs> the other problem is we're only getting a snapshot of their behavior. So, you know, whatever we find, you might say, well, maybe it was different two years basis, ago. Yeah, yeah, or maybe on a daily basis. Is this a difference between parents in California and parents in Illinois? Um, now, this study was done in England, so, <laughs> so this is a, a later study. So we didn't look at the parents so much in California and Illinois. Um, so these girls with CAH are playing more with the boys' toys and less with the girls' toys. Um, and for positive maternal responses to play with the girls' toys, the girls with CAH actually got more of these than they are unaffected sisters. And the Swedish research team has found also that parents say they want their daughters with CIH to be more feminine. So this makes sense in that context. They're not encouraging them to play with the boys' toys. And indeed, when they're in our lab and there are girls' toys around, they're trying to get them to play with those toys. And the fathers did the same thing. Even though the fathers and the mothers were tested separately, they did the same thing. So they gave more encouragement <coughs> to the girls with CIH than the unaffected girls. Um, 
parents very rarely give negative responses, probably especially when they're in our laboratory, the videotape, but the one situation where they did give negative responses is when boys played with girls' toys. And this is not unique to us. Other people have found this too. And you can, um, uh, you can probably see this in your day-to-day -day life, that if a boy picks up a doll, sometimes his mother and his father don't react well. And this is uh, even more so for fathers than for mothers. <laughs> they would prefer their sons not to be playing with girls' toys. Um, so anyway, but no evidence that the parents are encouraging these girls to be more masculine. But we can't rule it out because they're in our lab, not at home. Could have happened years ago. But it's a piece of evidence. OK, now I want to talk a little about this surge here. Um, because we know that that surge here also is involved in penile development. So maybe something's going on in the brain. The brain is still developing very rapidly. Uh, so in this study, we measured testosterone in urine samples of healthy full-term infants. And we took the first sample on day seven after birth, and then every month until six months after birth. And the parents completed a questionnaire called the Preschool Activities Inventory. It has 24 items. It asks about things like playing with dolls and playing with trucks. It also asks about rough and tumble play. Uh, it asks about you know dressing up as a princess. So lots of different gender type aspects of play behavior. And the way it's scored is that higher scores are more male typical. So this is a broader measure than just toys. It includes other aspects of play as well. And first of all, this is what we saw for the urinary testosterone values. So the blue line is boys and the red line is girls. So at about day seven, it's a little teeny bit higher in boys than in girls. But by one month postnatal, it's, that difference is bigger. So this is a surge. It's not just high from birth and then declining. And it gets down to baseline again by about six months postnatal. And this was very much what people had seen in blood samples from that previous image I showed you. Very similar. So we calculated the area under the curve for testosterone. And then we correlated that with um, the PSAI scores. And for the boys, the correlation was 0.46. So that's a pretty big correlation, especially for behavior. For girls, it was smaller, not significant. Now this is interesting. If you put the boys and the girls together, it looks like an enormous correlation. But that's because all the boys are up here and all the girls are down here. And sometimes I sometimes despair at this research area because people will do this all the time. And they'll say, oh, testosterone and amniotic fluid relates to gay behavior. But they put the boys and the girls together. So they're getting these spuriously large correlations. So really, this is only, um, only significant in the boys. And so it's. Um, one reason to be looking at normal variability is because the genetic conditions and the hormone administration are unusual situations. But, and the genetic conditions cause the gonads, I mean, the, the external genitalia to be different. So it's hard to interpret those data. But if you could see a correlation with normal variability, then the parents wouldn't know that this child had high testosterone or not because parents don't generally know that about their children. And so you wouldn't have to worry so much about differences in the way they were socialized. Um, so, but this is not, no one has tried to replicate this yet. So don't know if it will hold, hold up. Um, but another way to get at this might be to look at other species. So I was riding my bike on the beach with a friend one day in California and she said, what if you gave the toys to some monkeys? What would happen? So I thought, well, I can do that. We'll give the toys to some monkeys, and we'll see what happens. So we gave the toys to some vervet monkeys, because um, this is not how to design a study, by the way. You know, <laughs> but it is the way we did it. You know, We probably should have thought what species would be best. But we were very practical, and we said, oh, there are some people down the hall who have a colony of monkeys in the San Fernando Valley. And, they're vervet monkeys, so let's see if we can give them some toys. And they said yes. And so we gave them the toys, and um, we again coded the time they spent contacting each of the toys. And what we found to our surprise was that 
the male animals, there were 33 male animals and 30 female animals who contacted the toys. And the males spent more time with the boys' toys and the females spent more time with the girls' toys and there were no differences for the gender neutral toys. And they didn't always play with the toys. Um, but so he's kind of rolling that along the ground like a little boy might do. And she's trying to find out if that's a girl or a boy. <laughs> not going to be able to. So this was very surprising to everyone, not just us, but eventually some researchers in Atlanta tried it with rhesus monkeys, and they used wheeled toys, lots of different kinds of vehicles, and stuck toys, which actually are neutral toys. Um, and they did find that the male monkeys spent more time with the wheeled toys than the female monkeys. Okay, so that suggests that children's, I mean, that this um, really is, I think, startling because for many years when I would talk about this research, people would say, but these are all socially determined. This is completely random and it's just rehearsals for adult roles. And so it's made people think a bit differently about what is it about these toys? Why a truck? So, assumedly, if this is all real, that somehow there's some inborn tendency for people who have had a lot of testosterone early on to, or even monkeys, um, to gravitate toward vehicles. But vehicles weren't around when we were evolving, so what is it about these vehicles that makes them differentially interesting to males versus females? So we're trying to figure that out, but we haven't made much progress yet. Someone had a question? Did someone have a question? Yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering about why the male monkeys would be interested in the truck. Because for human beings, they are trucks and for boys and dogs, they are like princes. We kind of know that the dogs are monkeys, do they know the dogs are like princes and trucks are for males to drive? They don't. That's why? the interesting part of it. Is that because playing with trucks, you need to be more muscular, and playing with dogs, you need I don't think so. I think we don't know. That's what we're trying to figure out. Yes, but it suggests that it isn't all socially constructed. It suggests that there's something else going on. So this, uh, it's slightly random, but if there is this inherent interest in wheels and things that spin, what if you have touched wheels to dogs or stuff? <laughs> no, no, we're trying that. We are trying that. <laughs> And we tried that. We created all these toys, dolls without faces, trucks without wheels, dolls on wheels, you know, <laughs> trucks with faces. And I sent them all off to Japan because I no longer have the monkeys in the San Fernando Valley to study. And it's hard to find monkeys to study. There aren't large groups of monkeys around. There aren't any here at Cambridge, for instance. But I had a colleague who was working in Kyoto where there are there is a big group of monkeys. But they, just as my toys arrived, the facility said no more research. Oh. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't able to find out. So oh, or maybe uh, you can have a Barbie doll on ice skate, uh, inline skates. That, that might work. <laughs> 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 yes, but we also show pictures to babies. So maybe we oh. could do this with pictures to babies. And um, already by about 12 months of age, they look preferentially at sex type mm -hmm. toys. So. Maybe we can do it with babies instead of monkeys. Okay, what about other behaviors? Well, sexual orientation also seems to differ a bit in groups of women with CAH versus groups of women without CAH. So this is a relatively small study. We gave people questionnaires. Um, higher scores indicate you're less heterosexual, and so the females with CAH score a little higher. Is this the Kinsey scale, or? It's similar to a Kinsey scale, it, but it's a questionnaire rather than an interview. Uh, sorry, is this still three to eight years old? No, no, these are adults. Oh, okay. Everyone in that study was 18 <laughs> or older. Okay. And other people, again, have done these studies. Fewer than have looked at childhood play behavior, but um, seven different research teams have found this similar kind of result. And in this case, it's interesting because overall about 30% of women with CAH report not being exclusively or almost exclusively heterosexual. So 
that can be anywhere from liking males and females equally to preferring female partners. Um, but that means 70% are exclusively or almost exclusively heterosexual, which is what most women are. So um, they aren't that different, but they have a larger chance of not being exclusively or not exclusively heterosexual because the comparable figures for the general population and for the control groups in the study is about 5%. And the likelihood of reporting not being exclusively or almost exclusively heterosexual relates positively to disease severity. So there are, there are vari variations in the severity of the disease, and you can measure that by genotype. You can measure it physiologically. Um, you can measure it by how virilized they were when they were born. And in all of these respects, this relates to the behavioral outcome. And this is true for the toy choices as well. And what about gender identity? I said that shows a really big sex difference. How many women with CIH don't identify with being female? Um, about one to two percent of them see sex reassignment. So you might say that's not many, but if you compare it to the population, it's really huge. Okay? Yeah. So, and again, this has been seen in one clinic in New York and one in Canada. And in a review, a lot of these are case reports. So there was a review in 2005 that gathered together the hundreds of cases and found um, about the same thing as in the individual clinics. So not a lot of them want to change to live as men, but some do, and at a you know many times as many as you would expect otherwise. And if you give a questionnaire asking how strongly they're identified with being female, even among those who don't want to change their gender or their sex, they're less strongly identified with being female. So getting back to our factors that influence um, gender development, we've talked about the top three. What about the last one? Self-socialization based on gender identity understanding. So this is a big field of research in psychology. Children at about the age of two begin to know that they're girls or boys. They can sort their picture into the right pile. If you give them a bunch of pictures of males and females, they'll sort theirs into the right pile. Um, it's not until they're about four that they know that they didn't used to be the other sex or they're not gonna grow up to be the other sex. And it's not until they're about six that they know that if they do the things the other sex does, they aren't gonna change. So I think this is why, or other people think this too, the children in this, like four to six year old children are so strict about these gender rules, you know, because you might change if you were to do the other things. So um, at these ages, once they, as they get this gender identity understanding, they also start to respond to models of the same sex. So they'll imitate the behavior of people of the same sex more than people of the other sex. And if you tell them that certain things that are neutral, like green balloons and orange balloons are for girls or for boys, they'll want those things more that they've been told are for their own gender. So there's a lot of self-socialization going on. And you might think, well, if you don't identify as much with your gender, are you gonna self-socialize less? So that's, this is the last set of data I'm gonna show you where we've been looking at this. So we bring children with and without CAH, the relatives again, um, these children were four to 10 years old. Uh, a new set of children here in Cambridge now, um, actually from all over the UK. But you teach them that silver balloons are for girls or green balloons are for boys or vice versa, it's all balanced so that sometimes the green is for boys and sometimes for girls, but you teach them individually. Or that orange xylophones are for girls and yellow xylophones are for boys. And then you ask them, which do you like? So the girls with CAH, are less influenced by this information. The other children tend to choose the ones that have been, they've been told are for their own sex, and the girls with CAH are less likely to do that. How does this relate back to the data you showed earlier where girls with CAH are more commonly, um, I guess, pushed towards the feminine pool? By their parents, in that situation, right. yeah. So um, that's going on, right? So. But this is what's going on with the girl herself. So her okay. self-socialization 
she's not responding to this cue that these things are for girls and I should do it because I'm a girl. Because maybe she's learned she doesn't like the things that other girls like. So, but this this is another um, a kind of secondary mechanism that you know first you have the testosterone, then you don't like those toys, then you don't respond, you don't feel so identified as a girl, you don't respond to this information that this is for girls. And we also watch them. Then we would let them be in the playroom with the xylophones and the balloons and see what do they play with. And they do actually respond less in terms of their behavior as well. Um, okay, we did a modeling procedure as well where we had four men and four women all come in and say, there's an apple and a banana. And all the four women go, I like the apple. And all the four men go, I like the banana. And you do this with a series of pairs of items. And children will then, if you say, do you like apples or bananas? They'll tend to like the one that people of their own sex have been choosing, but not the girls with CAH. They're 50-50. So anyway, I think there's more going on than testosterone sort of zapping some part of your brain that then makes you um, have a certain behavior. Because the early, it becomes a trajectory that you begin with maybe a small change and then you build upon that by your social interactions. We know this for healthy, typically developing children, that if you're very gender typed when you're two and a half, you're even more so when you're eight. And we think that's because you then seek out environments that are comfortable for you, which are the more extreme environments. And this is probably happening with the girls with CAH as well. And the last point I want to make is that some outcomes show more influence than others. So children's play is probably you know, something parents generally let their daughters in particular play with whatever they want to play with. Um, and having CAH pushes you about 60% of the way to being the average male from being the average female. But with gender identity and sexual orientation, you're already pushed about 10% of the way. And maybe that's because there's stronger socialization pressures on those kind of um, outcomes. So the conclusion is, um, I think testosterone plays a role in human gender development. Its influence on children's sex-typical behavior is, is best established. But it influences some behaviors more than others and may not influence all behaviors that show sex differences. So people have been looking at spatial abilities, for instance, and that area is quite controversial. The evidence is not very convincing that androgen plays a role. There are many dimensions of gender behavior, and each is likely to be influenced by different combinations of genetic, hormonal, and social factors and their interactions. And we are also unique in having gender identity. I don't, I don't know how to test this exactly, but I don't think other species think of themselves as males or females. Um, and testosterone early in life may influence gender identity. And this could be a secondary mechanism that amplifies the influence of testosterone on outcomes. So does your brain have a gender? Your brain is a mosaic of many different gender-related elements on continuums of masculinity and femininity. And your brain responds to experience. I didn't really have time to get into this. Um, but when I was being trained as a neuroscientist, I was told, you have all the neurons you're ever going to have when you're born, and that's it. You're just going to be losing them. But now we know that's not true. New neurons can be born. Every time we learn something, we aren't necessarily getting new neurons, but we are getting some reorganization of our brain, or else we wouldn't be able to retain what we've learned. So at an individual time point, you could be more or less masculine or feminine than you might be at another one. And that's got to be somewhere in your brain. So your brain doesn't have a singular or a constant gender. <coughs> and these are just people I've worked with and funders to thank. So thank you. I've kept you here a long time. <laughs> we can have more discussion I understand over yeah. wine and cheese. I think we'll take one or two questions right now and then move to the MCR where we've got lots of snacks. Stick around for a bit. Yes, happy to stick around. Um, have there been any 
here, and looking at studies between CAH women and, and non-CAH women, and looking at sort of gross brain structural differences? Very few, very yeah. few. And I actually, today at the National Institutes of Health, they're reviewing my proposal to look at <laughs> <laughs> brains with a really talented neuroscientist at UCLA named Eileen Luders, who has done a lot of work with men and women, um, right. healthy men and women. And, we're going to look at people with CAH as well as people with complete androgen and sensitivity syndrome. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, fingers crossed. So, um, yeah, the only studies so far have looked at, have been very, they were a long time ago, and what they suggested was that people with CAH had some white matter abnormalities in their brain, but not so much along gender lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, because there are, there are sexual, there are sexual, well, the nuclei between men and women. Well, the two most consistently replicated mm -hmm. sex differences in human brain are one brain size, so the male mm -hmm. brain's bigger than the female brain by about 10%. And two, there's a nucleus in the hypothalamus called the interstitial nucleus of the anterior hypothalamus number three. Mm -hmm. But you can't visualize that INA3 mm -hmm. with current techniques. You have to wait for people to die and slice their brains up and, exactly. and stain them with things. So <laughs> nobody's done that. And the other, although there are numerous, hundreds of studies of sex differences either using structural or functional MRI, mm -hmm. no two studies are alike. So it's very hard to see what's replicating and what isn't. There's a publication very recent in the last couple of years where um, it was amazing how uncomparable the methodologies that people had used, but out of like 350 studies, I, I'm making these up, but they're not far off what it actually was, you know, 330 different methodologies were used. So it's very hard to um, know what's going to stand the test of time, really, for, for differences beyond that. I mean, those two have been replicated repeatedly using the same methodology. Um, I was just going to follow up on that. So how much difference do you expect to see if you do like new imaging between, um, for example, CH and normal population? Don't know. We, we have to look. Because, yeah, I mean, <laughs> like, if you're doing fMRI and stuff like that, presumably you wouldn't have the resolution high enough to actually see hormone differences and stuff like that, right? And you, um, would, you would, like, hypothesize that these um, hormone differences would lead to, like, Structural differences or something like that? Or Maybe. So in, in the rodent yeah. homologue yeah. of the INA3, which is something called the sexually dimorphic nucleus of the preoptic area, there are more neurons if you have testosterone okay. than if you don't. And the volume of the nucleus is bigger. So if right. that's happening elsewhere, you might expect to see structural changes of that sort. But the kinds of things that Eileen sees mainly are things like um, for sex differences, although her things haven't been replicated either because people just don't do the same thing for some mm -hmm. reason. They just, you know, if there's no payoff for replicating something, everybody right. wants to be the first to show something. But she finds, for instance, um, and she did this, she, such a clever thing, she, because the male brain's bigger than the female brain, mm -hmm. It's very hard to then look at sex differences because everything's probably bigger in the male brain. So how do you adjust for that? If you just divide by brain size, then everything becomes bigger in the female brain. So um, you're more confident if you see something that's the opposite of that, like this INA3 is bigger even if you adjust for brain size. So that's you know that should make things bigger in females, but it's still bigger in males. So that that's one way to do it. But what she did is she matched men and women for brain size. Mm -hmm. And then she looked at what differences there were. And she also looked at men and women <coughs> extremes, so big brain and little brain, big brain and little brain. And she didn't find size differences, but she found that the female brain was more gyrified, more convoluted than the male brain, even when they're matched for size. So those are the kinds of things we'll be looking at. Okay, so last question for um, did you suggest that girls prefer to play with dolls before they know they're girls and before they identify with their mothers? Yes. I'm not astonished. 
<laughs> it is astonishing, isn't it? Yes. yes. Wait, yeah. but didn't you answer a previous question saying you do not know what they have been playing with at home? Well, we can see this this in infants, so they haven't been playing at home with these things because they really aren't that adept at okay. doing things. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. It's upset. Uh, yeah. <laughs>